difficult subjects, uh, dependent origination, paticca samuppada, um, which is one of the seminal teachings of the Buddha and is singled out as one of the transforming realizations that he had on the night of his enlightenment and also that the previous Buddhas, they referenced the previous uh, human beings who have in the past awakened in a similar way, that this insight into how suffering arises, how we roll on into continued craving, rebirth, and loss, that this was the essential way that those human beings saw the world for at least a moment, or at least this is how they articulated it in that moment of awakening. And I was in Bodh Gaya, uh, the site of the Buddha's enlightenment, last year in late January and early February before the pandemic. And for those of you who haven't been, it's worth the trip. Um, there's, uh, I, there were thousands of Tibetan monks and nuns and women um, and uh, thousands of Buddhists from all over the world who are constantly prostrating, full-length prostrations. The Tibetans will lay out these planks and... Uh, place felt pads on their hands and uh, prostrate down. And some will uh, have knee pads in these rubber aprons and they'll circumambulate the um, pagoda, the Mahabodhi temple, as it's called, uh, just doing full-length prostrations the entire way. And it was the most moving thing I believe I've ever seen. And when you're near this site of the Bodhi tree, which is a tree from the original cut of the original tree, um, you really do feel something. And it's crowded and noisy, but whenever you get frustrated at how slowly the people walking around the temple are walking, you realize it's because some faithful Tibetan grandmother is prostrating and then you you can't really be angry so it's quite good that way but I remember um, I have a teacher who uh, his name is Ajahn Achalo and he would spend um, significant periods of every year meditating under the tree and it's really something there's always always people there and um, he would meditate I believe at this point he's done 3,000 hours or so and so I, I went to meditate with him and to meditate in that place. And I remember the first evening I was there, the monks inside the temple started chanting the uh, chain of dependent origination. And it was very moving because it was the place where that essential insight had occurred. So... Usually it's phrased as 12 links, but I don't know if it's possible to do any sort of justice to that entire chain right now. So what might be better is to start with the summarized version the Buddha gave. So when the Buddha spoke about how different things come into being and how the conditions around us are related to one another. That can sound esoteric if you haven't heard this language before, but one of the essential insights in 
the path of spiritual traditions is that we are surrounded by a vortex of changing conditions which we constantly try to crystallize and to cling to for support, but they're always shifting under our feet. And this is the source of our anxiety and of our suffering. And only by finding an internal refuge and eventually a refuge beyond all conditions, complete liberation of the heart, can one exist in that shift, shifting vortex without losing oneself to it. And when the Buddha spoke of how this different elements in this conditioned realm influence one another, the most essential way he spoke of it, before going into the entire 12 links of Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, which we don't have to touch right now, is uh, something he called specific conditionality, um, ida, ida pachayata. And it's articulated very simply. When this is, that is. When this comes into being, that comes into being. When this isn't, that isn't. When this ceases, that ceases. So it sounds very simple on the surface, but what it's pointing to are two time frames that occur simultaneously. You have things that are related to one another conditionally, concurrently, in the moment. So when one thing happens, immediately the other is present. Um, I believe the example I've heard before is if one sticks one's hand in a fire, it burns, it hurts, it's hot. Those are things that arise concurrently. Whereas if one, uh, the other one, when one, one thing arises, another arises. When this arises, that arises. When this ceases, that ceases. Those are things that occur temporally across time. So if one lies to one another person, then that person ceases to trust one in the future if they find out. Things that uh, happen across time. And that means that our present experience in any moment is composed of three factors. The fruit of past action, the present intentions we bring to our experience, and the results of those present intentions. So there's implications of this. One is that it reveals how we dodge, the Buddha avoided the dangerous extremes of looking at everything as completely free will, or uh, rather completely, every moment as a complete blank slate. Because there are these fruits from past actions we've done, but also avoided any deterministic notion of the world. And both of these were philosophical views that were very present at the time. Um, because we do have our present intentions, and those do have results. And one might ask where those present intentions come from, and aren't they also conditioned? But the Buddha didn't go there. Um, every philosophical system works on some a priori assumptions, and the Buddha's path is one of practicality only for the sake of liberation. And so these rabbit holes weren't seen as relevant. We act with mindfulness and we can bring different intentions to any situation. And if we do that, then the situation can be dramatically different. As we practice and our minds gain strength and centeredness and our hearts become larger, I think this aspect of present intention becomes very increasingly important and its gravity increasingly visible because we see how the same, when we begin to meditate more, when the mind begins to collect and strengthen through a daily practice of calm and centering, 
then that present moment intention becomes more and more vital. It's almost as if the Buddhist term sankara, which could be translated as formation or program, it's how we act, uh, the ways we act automatically in the world, say our personality type as an extrovert, how we sort of are comfortable coming into situation. And as we grow older, those sankharas, those programs, pile on one after another and they gain strength. And at some point, we could be said to be acting almost as complete automatons, completely in line with our programs. And you see that with people who haven't had a chance to cultivate some sort of peace or quiet in their lives sometimes is this automatic pilot which begins to almost encompass the whole of a person's being and life. And the Buddha said that those who are mindful are alive, never die. Whereas those who act without mindfulness, mindfulness are as if dead already. And I find that it, this is pointing to this exact quality that if we're mindful, then we have a chance to look at those programs and step back from them a little bit. Um, and even though mindfulness itself is a sankara at some level, but uh, that this quality of awareness sheds light on all these things. And if we don't have that, then our lives become, there's no life. It's a, an existence that's completely aut automatic. And so when we gain the strength and centeredness of heart, we suddenly gain a huge amount of freedom because the present intention aspect of any situation becomes pregnant with potential. And one example might be if I think we've all been in situations with people who are extremely difficult and the natural reaction of the heart and of the sankharas is to escape or be averse. But if we change our perception and therefore our intention of that, uh, towards that situation, then what can become an inconvenience and difficulty can become an enormous opportunity. So one beautiful way of looking at this, and I think this is embodied especially well in, uh, or articulated very well in many of the Mahayana schools, is there's this idea of a, the bodhisattvas manifesting into the world to teach, and in any form that they might. So a bodhisattva might come and manifest as the drunkard on the street, or as the difficult neighbor. And I found, regardless of how true literally that is, to look at the entire world as a teaching to us. And I found that this is one of the most powerful ways to work with difficult people and situations, is the world only throws this at you if you can handle it. And if you can really take someone, um, I lived with a very meticulous monk once who constantly uh, scolded me about everything, um, how I closed doors, how I opened drawers. Um, and I really realized that if I looked at him as my teacher and took him as my teacher in a certain sense, obviously within limits, that he was giving me the exact sort of refined teaching that they say the Kruba Ajans, like Ajahn Mun, gave to their disciples. The only difference is that with the Kruba Ajans, the great teachers, people respected them enough to take everything they said as a teaching. Whereas with these normal people in our lives, even though they may be saying something very similar, even though their intentions may not be pure, the teaching is the same if you take it as the same. 
And so to look at people in your lives as the, especially the difficult people as bodhisattvas is one way where you can alter present intention and completely change the situation because the past result is the same. Maybe this person, you know, it was in your lot to have a, this difficult neighbor, but by altering present intention, by having that strength of heart, and it does take daily centering and recentering and meditation to do that, um, then the entire situation shifts. There's a famous story of a ashram where there was one extremely difficult member of the ashram or meditation center and he always was getting in people's way, scolding others, making a mess. And one day they had, the group had a gathering of some sort and he really made a mess of things and they chased him away. And when the teacher asked where this man had gone, they told him what had happened and said that they just told him to leave. And he got quite upset uh, and said, no, no, I, I pay that man to be here. He's the best teacher for all of you. So it echoes another story of uh, the teacher that the Tibetans say brought Vajrayana to Tibet. They said that initially he'd heard, he was from India, and he had heard that the Tibetans were two uh, extremely nice people. And so he... Uh, decided he had to bring his chaiwala, his uh, tea-making assistant, who was an extremely annoying man, with him, just so he would still have a teacher when he went up to Tibet. So this is the freedom of the path, not the freedom to change our conditions, but the freedom to exist within conditions and take them always as a teaching. And it's the true meaning of, of the homeless life. In a sense, we can all embark on that. The Buddha said in the Samyutta Nikaya that one who clings to form, feeling, perception, consciousness, sankhara, the five khandhas, the five aspects of a personality that we cling to as a self, is said to be one who, wan uh, who wanders around in a home, whereas one who gives up and relinquishes that clinging is one to, who's said to be free from wandering around in a home. And this is the difference, is that as we practice, if we stop looking to the world as our source of security, because it can never be that, and take it instead as a teaching, one opportunity to learn and grow and be shaped by sadness and tragedy, into something worthy to help others. This is the essential difference in a homeless life versus a home-holding life. And it is not predicated on wearing robes or not wearing robes. Long Por Liam famously said that there are no obstacles, only worthy adversaries. And I think one beautiful way of conceptualizing Kama is not that we're being punished for past deeds, but rather the fact that we've done something in the past to another means that the world is trying to teach us what it was like so that we never do it again, or so that we do do it again. And that doesn't have to be taken in some esoteric sense. Uh, just that 
when we help or hurt others, those results frequently do come back to us and we see what it was like. And if all those are taken as just one opportunity to learn very deeply what our actions ripple out as so that we take more care with our actions, then every difficulty in life is one more teaching, is one opportunity to learn and be shaped in just exactly the way we need to be shaped. But this doesn't happen naturally. And so, as we exist in this milieu of past fruit, fruit of past action, present intention, and fruit of present intention, only if we take the time to practice and to meditate do we gain the power of heart, the, the strength of heart, to make that factor of present intention strong enough to orient ourselves like this towards the world. And the other implication of specific conditionality, which I appreciate, is uh, Ajahn Tanisaro has pointed this out, is that when you have a system of conditions where there's this concurrent influencing of conditions on one another, of things arising concurrently, when this is, that is, when this isn't, that isn't, and temporal influencing, when this comes into being, that comes into being, when this ceases, that ceases, then the system becomes chaotic. It's extremely complex. And two fascinating aspects of chaotic systems is something called uh, scale invariance and resonance points. And scale invariance um, means that if you've seen a, a man, I think they're called a Mandelbrot set, it's a fractal where if you zoom in or zoom out, it looks the exact same, uh, much like they're all uh, present all throughout nature, um, sort of spirals where no matter what frame you're looking at the thing through, it looks the same because it's a repeating pattern that expands. And chaotic systems have this aspect where if you look at them in a small microcosm, it looks the same as on a large macrocosm. And this sounds all very academic, but what it means is that when you sit down to meditate and see how you interact with the simplest things in your mind, then you see how you interact with everything. And I think most of us have had that experience in meditation of realizing how you're clamping down on the breath and berating the breath and controlling the breath, and then realizing that's what you do to everything in your life. Or seeing how you interact with yourself in meditation. And as neurotic, self-flagellating modern people like most of us are, I can't speak for everyone, but I certainly am, um, then seeing what brutal how brutally we judge ourselves in the moments of meditation and seeing how we actually bring that attitude to everything in our lives, external actions as well. And what that means is that as you soften and gentle your relationship with these subtle, seemingly insignificant aspects of your mind and heart in meditation and in daily life, just learning how to breathe more gently, learning that it's okay to step back, becoming sensitive to when effort becomes forceful. Then, because of scale invariance, that same shift in intention pervades everything. It pervades how you interact with your spouse. It means that you don't 
come down on the child when they mess up in the same way because you've changed your intentions at their most basic level and the seed and the ripple radiates. And this is why meditation is not, it's deceptively simple and unobtrusive in a life. And yet, and those who don't practice in that way can not realize what meditation really does. But by altering our intentions at their very core, then everything in life changes. And the other implication of dependent of specific conditionality of the chaotic system is a resonance point, which is the fact that in chaotic systems there come points where the mathematical equation modeling the system is divided by zero and the system breaks. And this uh, can be said to be a way of looking at how this path leads to something unconditioned. That there are points in this conditioned existence where something that is transcendent of it can be reached. And that is Nibbana. So in this, in one of the, my favorite suttas about dependent origination, it's called the Pachaya Sutta, Samyutta Nikaya 12.20. And the Buddha says that whether or not a Tathagata arises in the world, this element remains the fixed course of Dhamma, the stability of Dhamma, specific conditionality. Titawa sa datu, damatitata, damaniyamata, didapachayata. And he then goes on to speak about this invariability of Dhamma, the not otherwiseness of Dhamma, the thusness of Dhamma. And you can tell by the language he's trying to point to something which cannot completely be articulated, but I feel you can get a feel for what it means. The words are. Uh, Tatata is thusness. Awitatata is not otherwiseness. Ananyatata. Uh, basically, these terms point to a sense, for me, of stability and okayness. I don't know how to put it. But he says that this element persists. And for me, this, this suit is important because it's the counterbalance to the aspects of existence which are so frequently referenced in suttas of variability, of not-self, of suffering. These three characteristics do exist throughout the world and exist and our lives. But also there is this, the sense that this process of conditioned origin, of conditioned dependent origination, of specific conditionality, is a process which has a logic. And that might not seem much of a refuge, but... I think most of us have the experience of seeing something that seems off. Say a program, a sankara, a personality construct in ourselves, which is undesirable and which we really don't like. Say we always have to be the center of attention and we can't help ourselves. And it's wrong in the sense that it feels wrong. It's, we think it shouldn't belong. And yet as soon as you trace that back, and this is the beauty of meditation, is the chance to see how these things came into being. 
as soon as you trace it back to the moment when you were a kid with five brothers and sisters, and the only way you could get your needs taken care of was to be the center of attention and to put yourself out there and that there's no other way. Or maybe your parents or father was less than kind at times. And the only way you could diffuse a situation was to act the clown. And when you see where these parts of ourselves, which seem so mis, mis, such like such misfits, so unfortunate and things that don't belong, when you see where they came from, when you see how they were conditioned, how this process led to them, then it's somehow okay. And the Buddha said that, well, this is the directive of the first noble truth, is to look at and comprehend our suffering. And so I think this can apply in terms of tracing back things to their initial wound which gave rise to them. So finding where that initial wound and need and want which created the strange and awkward and imperfect people that we are. And if you see that, then it somehow is just as it should be. And it doesn't mean that you don't work to change it, but you can work to change it without aversion. And I know Longpur Suchitto has said that self-compassion, the essence of self-compassion, is just understandings, understanding one's own conditioned nature the condition that the conditions that gave rise to one and then one can speak to that frightened child and thank them for how they helped one survive and say i don't need you right now anymore but thank you really and then you can look at the friend who is less than perfect, or the spouse who is deeply flawed, and say, I understand where this part of you comes from. And I can accept, I can accept that. And when the Buddha speaks about this invariability of Dhamma, this not otherwiseness, this thusness, the element of stability, a fixed course. I believe this is what he's pointing to. That sense of it's okay. As Long Sumedho would say, it's like this. Ta ta ta. A we ta ta ta. Anya ta ta. And the Buddha said that he was came to the world to beat the drum of the deathless. And I've always thought of these epithets of the Buddha or these ways he referred to the Dhamma as just that drumbeat, ta-ta-ta, a wee ta-ta-ta. And I believe he was I don't quite know the proper analogy, but something about how the world comes into being with all of its imperfection and suffering. I mean, the Buddha pointed to two arrows. One is the arrow of the world and the khandas, the personality, this imperfect situation we find ourselves in. And the second is the arrow we shoot ourselves with after, how we compound problems and turn a slightly averse mood into hatred. And that second arrow is what we focus on, taking out. That's what the Buddha's path removes and which allows us to exist with the first arrow just as it is, and that's okay. And without a wound, how can we experience the raw nature of the world with compassion? So for me, it's a great relief to know that the Buddha thought that our hearts were big enough to accept the world in all of its imperfection if we just realize how it came into being and that in that sense 
in that every effect, no matter how strange it appears, actually has a cause. In that sense, it is perfect. And we can exist with it without being averse to it. And obviously, I don't think he'd say that conditioned existence was perfect in every sense, just that it all has that quality of the stability of Dhamma, of being conditioned in this way. And that as we get to know that more and more, we can exist at peace with it. Okay, I think we actually have uh, time for a bit of discussion if people want it. Um, yeah, I'm glad we didn't try to go into the 12 links. I think Longpur Suchito famously led a retreat titled Dependent Origination, Beginning Dependent Origination for Advanced Meditators. And it's those 12 links are a profound piece of psychology, but they are sub... Uh, as the Buddha said, if one understands them, they understand the Dhamma. So if people have any subjects they'd like to discuss, um, we have a bit of time. And it's good to see everyone. Tamira, Ladawan, Mahisha, Jay, Marilyn, Kathy, Dhammadipa, Venerable, Namaste Khan, good to see you. We get your uh, kind um, messages, and it is lovely to have a friend over there. So it's great to meet you. So JML asks, could this longish time of relative peace after record-breaking world wars be an example of a kind of fractal, something similar supposed to happen later according to Buddhist cosmology? That's a great question. I don't know. Um... You know, the Buddhist cosmology is, is confusing and some of it is, uh, you know, not all of the texts are from the Buddha himself. Um, and I suppose the only relevant reflection I might be able to, to offer on that would just be that it does help me personally when I get become afraid for the state of the world or of politics to see how this pattern repeats and how the Buddha interacted with it. So the Buddha's time was rife with war and the kings were not all good people. Um, King Bimbisara, one of his uh, foremost disciples who was a stream enterer, was murdered by his son, King Ajatasattu. And King Achatasattu was extremely ambitious. He invaded neighboring the neighboring uh, country of Vajja and um, was notorious. And yet, when he came to the Buddha, the Buddha received him and spoke with him. And by the end, King Achatasattu said, I have, I have made an enormous transgression. I have destroyed, killed my father who was a good man. And the Buddha said, one who acknowledges fault grows in the dis discipline of the noble ones. And in the end, King Ajitasattu actually sponsored the first council of uh, Buddhist monks where they compiled all the texts. He did an immense act of goodness and actually came to the support of uh, King Pasanadi in the north uh, when he was attacked. And then the Buddha's um, clan was later uh, slaughtered, uh, the Sakyans. Um, one of the kings in the north wanted a relative of the Buddha as his wife and so requested uh, that one be, uh, do, uh, relative be sent. But the, Vaj, um, 
the Sakians were too proud and sent a slave woman instead, and they had a child. And when the son found out that he was not a real heir of the Sakian lineage, he was so ashamed that he attacked Sakya and slaughtered its people. And so the Buddha existed, and these things have been happening for ages. And not to downplay climate change, you know, um, but just to say that I, I do find that looking at how these fractals repeat over time and the equanimity that this, that people could exist even in those conditions with has helped me and given me strength. It really is good to see the same names here frequently, so... Any other things people would like to discuss? Let's do the 12 links, JM says. <laughs> that would be good. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. I don't know how equipped I am to talk about it, to be honest, but... Okay, we'll call it good. Everyone takes take care and stay safe and... Uh, see everyone next week uh that'll be my last talk um on friday before i leave but uh i'll be continuing live streams um on a separate channel on a separate day so i don't interfere um and it would be as always lovely to see you all and i'll provide links to all that next friday <laughs>